All right, this is Christian Bunsby Podcast, where we discuss black LGBT issues and topics. And today, I have a very interesting guest I, I'm very, very happy to actually have on my show. Uh, he is, to kind of give a little background first, he is an award-winning New York Post reporter for 15 years, and also City Hall reporter from 1999 to 2008, where he was the lead writer of Legislative Affairs. He's covered things from crime, courts, labor issues, human services, public health, politics, etc. And he is now an author. And this particular book is called Lives of Great Men, which is an exploration of the lives of contemporary LGBTQ men and women of the African continent and in diaspora. Everyone, will you please welcome Mr. Chike Frank Indosian. How are you, sir? Fine. Thank you so much for having me. Thank very, you. Very thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I was I kind of, I've always kind of liked to search around and find out what are some of the things that I think some of our listeners would love to listen to. And one of the things that we really actually not really had that many international uh, (laughs) from basically from other continents, um, authors, writers. And so we're going to try to do things a little bit differently, especially with 2018. And I definitely want to kind of explore this book a little bit further. Now, I gave a little brief history in regards to some of the things that you've actually done before. You did graduate from New York University. Is that correct? I did indeed. <laughs> it's such a long time ago, but yes, I did graduate. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm very, I'm very happy to see that. <laughs> now you, but now you've yeah, also, absolutely. you've also went further to become a professor within New York University, a professor of journalism. Is that correct, also. Yes, yeah, so, so I, I had uh, you know a, a varied career um, here in America, and one of the things that uh, was very exciting for me when I left daily journalism, I was a political reporter for many years, as you referenced, uh, covering government and politics uh, here in the Big Apple, but also statewide issues as well. But when I left daily journalism, I really was at a point in my career where I had started a publication called the African Magazine. Yes, and. Um, it was me and a bunch of other friends of mine who one of the things we wanted to do was to tell stories of the African in the diaspora, the African in the Americas, the African in Europe, the African in Asia. And even though I had had this uh, long running job as a newspaper journalist in New York, it was always it was not always easy to tell those stories. Uh, so a few years ago, before I left the New York Post, one of the things that we tried to do was that we started a, a publication, which was called The African. And we explored, you know, uh, people who have a, a more direct uh, connection with the African continent in that maybe their father or their mother uh, emigrated from the African continent to America versus the African-American who was brought here in chains generations ago. And so we wanted to tell stories around those um, those Barack Obamas, if you would, <laughs> who had this very direct tie through a parent or both parents um, to the African continent, or even those people who, like me, left the African continent to come to America and um, have an education. Right. I, I landed in New York City when I was 19 years old after spending my entire life in Nigeria. So there was also this category of people who... Uh, black men and women and their stories sort of was not easy to find so when i left the new york post after i'm working on the african magazine for a few years on the side you know everybody has you know their kind of hustle the new york post was my day job my night job was telling the african story but when i left the uh the the new york post i wanted to just continue to do that and for a while i did some fellowships and i did some reporting on the african continent and then I was approached by New York University, which had something called the Reporting Africa program. Okay. uh, Where essentially the mission was to continue to create a way to train foreign correspondents or rather future foreign correspondents, but also to have a more nuanced um, approach to the African continent. And so I went there uh, in 2008 to run the Reporting Africa program to design a program, to build it up, and then to teach in the journalism school. And so for the last couple of years, I have been on the faculty of my alma mater, running the uh, NYU Journalism Reporting Africa program, teaching basic journalism skills, teaching international reporting. And while I've been there, I've also been doing other things which led to the lives of great men. Because even when you're in academia as a journalist, you continue to do the work that 
it's passionate to you. And so telling the stories of Africans and people in the diaspora has always been not really a passion, but really more like a like a mission. I really see my career as, you know, being blessed to be able to tell those stories. And so part of that is how Lives of Great Men came along. Now, you know, they'll have the word author next to your name uh, because, you know, it seems like you've done some really amazing things and reported some really, really impactful things that really society needs to understand. Now, to, to bring that to become an author, was that something that you already knew that eventually you were going to have that kind of tacked onto your repertoire or was that something that you really <laughs> did not really think about it? I, you know, I learned how to um, read and write from newspapers. And I've never had any, um, my whole career has always been with words okay. you know, and storytelling. So I've always known that I was going to contribute to books, which I'd actually done before this. This is my first standalone book, but I've actually, my work has been in, in other books and been anthologized in other areas, but this is my first standalone book. So yes, I'm, I'm fully an author now, but I've always <laughs> known that <laughs> that my work and storytelling would evolve into long form. So I've always seen myself as someone who would make um, potentially documentaries, who would do uh, books, and who would do things that would last longer than my daily journalism. So so it is, it is wonderful to have finished this project. Now, I didn't know this would be the topic that would be my first book. Um, standalone book. I didn't know that, but I've always known and I've always thought about as a person who was doing this work that some of the issues and some of the things that I was trying to bring out are best told in long, long form, not just magazine long form, but long form where you sit down and you really take the time to do it. And you can only really do that with books or with documentaries. Now, when, you know, BBC said this is the Nigeria's first gay memoir. So this, so for this to be your first standalone book and to be the first gay memoir, how does that feel? It feels, it, you know, I mean, at the time I was doing this work, you really don't think about all those things until people point it out to you. I found it a bit surprising. Um, but on the other hand, I also knew that when I was trying to write this book that there was nothing for me to look at that looked like it you know there have been books about sexuality on the african continent and even in nigeria before but most of them were couched in fiction gotcha. you know okay. so there have been novels before and there have been explorations of this in fiction but when the bbc pointed out that there had not been a standalone non-fiction book that was a memoir, somebody telling their story and their family story. Um, that actually surprised me, but maybe not so much because I know how dangerous and how difficult it is to be a public um, homosexual. My friend, the writer, um, the Kenyan writer, Bigiranga Wainaina, had a memoir that didn't ex deal with this in that fashion, but at some point he added a chapter to it, which was called The Lost Chapter where he comes out. So that was the only thing that I think was sort of, you know, an African just sort of coming out in, in book form. You know, other people have said that they haven't found memoirs, not just from Nigeria, but from around Sub-Saharan Africa that dealt with this. I'm not sure how correct that is. But, you know, one of the things about being first is that you really don't think you're first. You're just trying to do good work. Right. And right. if it is the first gay nonfiction memoir from Nigeria or from Sub-Saharan Africa, I am very um, proud and privileged to have had a hand in, in bringing these issues to light. But I know that there are certainly far more braver people than me around the continent. And my reporting has shown that. Now, when it came down to how well it was received within your homeland... How well, because I know you mentioned, of course, it was very dangerous to do so, especially when it comes to uh, certain beliefs when it comes to LGBT. How was yes. that received? It's interesting because the book is still fairly new, okay. and many people have read it in Nigeria. Many people have read it because they have friends or family members or they're on Kindle and have been able to access the book. Uh, the book is, you know, the, the book has not been 
published by a Nigerian publisher. So it is difficult for the masses to have it. But we're such a, a global interconnected world. So many people have, you know, sent me photos of the book and people have been writing me, telling me how the book has changed their lives. I've been hearing from young people telling me that, you know, they, they, they contemplated suicide and they finally have something that they can sit with and read and feel a little bit different and make different choices because they now realize that they are not the only ones. You know, one of the things that's so insidious about shaming with sexuality is that you you tend to feel if everyone is telling you that this is such a horrible thing that you're alone. Yeah. You know, and that the vast majority of people that are out there have no connection to you. And one of the things that I've gotten in all my emails from people who've written me is that reading my words and reading the stories that I tell about my life and my friends and my family and the dangers we've been in and how we've, we've come out of skate and even when we escaped, how we held our, uh, our heads high has made such a positive difference to them. Now, this is just from people who receive the books as Christmas presents from friends. Yes. Or people who, you know, have Kindle and were able to access the ebook. You know, I'm quite curious, you know, what will happen later this year when the book is released by a Nigerian publisher is priced for the masses over there it's not you know it's available to everyone who can afford to to pick it up you know i know now that the people who have received it are kind of people who you know they're sort of in a position where they're kind of lucky they have friends who travel abroad or people who brought it for them or they have they can afford to have a kindle device and they can afford to buy it you know, I, I'd be very happy to answer this question again when it's really, really available to right. the masses. Published by a Nigerian publisher, priced for uh, the Nigerian market, and it's sold. And, you know, one of the, the, the things that I'm doing this year is I've taken the book to Nigeria and to several other African countries to publish it in local markets. You know, the book is not a book that is um, inaccessible. Right. Right. You know, it's not even in America. It's priced at uh, fourteen ninety nine, so it's a very, very accessible book, and that was part of the strategy, that it should not be a book that people cannot afford or have difficulty finding. You know, so every market that we take this book to, it will be priced for the masses, and I will be there to to listen. I have had such a wonderful response from people who have finished the book. You know, it has really touched people in ways that I, I did not imagine. But I also know that at some point, there are gonna be some people who don't like things in it. So I'm, I'm ready for that. I'm ready to have that conversation. Yeah, but so far, knock on wood, it's been wonderful from the actual people who have spent the money to buy it or have received it and have read it from cover to cover. Usually I hear from people when they're in chapter four or chapter five telling me how wonderful it is and I say, to them, would you please write me back when you finished? <laughs> 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 you know, I, I know that you are, you know, and, and that's sort of like part of the thing is that, you know, when people start seeing themselves in literature, yes, when people start seeing themselves in places where they typically do not, or if the representation of them is, um, is horrid, or it's horrible, or it's skewed, you know, so when you, you, you come upon a, a version of yourself in literature that is maybe accurate, even if flawed, but is not a complete put down. You you sort of feel very happy, and so when people are telling me, "Oh, I'm in chapter five and this is wonderful," and I'm like, "Okay, I, I, I know what's happening," you know, and I, I and I and I'm loving the praise. So please write me back when you have finished the last word, exactly. and then you can give me your your honest <laughs> assessment. Because as I told, you know, someone, um, a group of Nigerian um, writers and editors put out a, an anthology. Actually, it just came out two days ago. Um, it's called it's, it's called Fourteen, okay. and it's by writers who were uh, celebrating the the second anniversary of Nigeria's anti-gay, anti-marriage laws. And so they're fighting it with literature. And they did a question and answer with me about the the book. And, you know, the the writer who interviewed me had finished the book and he said to me something that made me laugh. And he was like, you you didn't hold back in talking about the things about yourself that are maybe not so kind or not so candid. And and I said to him, you know, as as a gay person, I know that we can be wonderful and we can be great, but we can also be kind of messy. 
<laughs> we can also, you know, we can also we can also be kind of catty. We can yeah. also be kind of kind of bitchy and unkind, and all of that stuff <laughs> is what makes us uh, the complex, wonderful human beings that we are. And so, yes. I don't shy away from talking about my flaws. You know, which is why I always tell people, well, get to the end of the book and see if you still like me. No, oh my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> because, you know, in, in the beginning, you know, I'm telling you all these wonderful things and all these people that I know. But I also, I, you know, I had to take a, a deep dive. If I want people to really understand who we are as Africans who are proud of ourselves and as Christians who are proud to be gay, um, we really have to look at ourselves once and all and raise the parts of us that are growing, but acknowledge the things that... You know, I, there are things in the book that I'm not, uh, not that I'm not proud of, but looking back, I would have made different choices, certain kinds of relationships, certain things that you put up with. Um, and those things, I, I felt it was necessary to expose myself in that way so that people know that they're not alone. We all make mistakes, but do we learn from them is what's important. You know, you you know, there's a couple of things that you mentioned that I do want to find out. So I, I take it that you are currently trying to get a publisher to distribute this within Nigeria. Is that correct? Well, so, you know, the way this works is that my publisher um, currently, I have a publisher for America and Europe and I think Australia and the rest of the world. But the publisher that published this book, which is Team Angelica, which has this wonderful groundbreaking house, they do not have um, they do not have um, branches, so to speak, on the African continent, which gotcha. is fine. That's not their that's not their market. Gotcha. You know, gotcha. They, they don't sell books in Africa. That's not what they do. They sell book. They have sold books about Africa, but you know, there's a whole different infrastructure there. Of course. So basically, what happens is that you know, when you publish your book anywhere, you, maybe you have published with a big company that has world rights and can distribute your book anywhere. You know, I published with a small house that has um, a publishing infrastructure all over America and Europe and parts of um, Australia and New Zealand. So for the areas that I, you know, really care about, which is Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, we have to now find publishing partners in each of those different countries or each of those different regions. And that's where we are now. So if you talk to me later this year, I know that the book will be published locally in Nigeria. I just can't tell you when. Of course. But I am very, very grateful for all of the Nigerian friends and family and even those people who don't know me who have made a point of asking all their friends, if you're going to London, if you're going to America, please come back with this book. And the great thing about social media is that people have been sending me pictures of the book in all, all sorts of towns and in all sorts of places. Wow. So it's been really, really wonderful, yeah. Wow. I mean, people, wow. you know, send me stuff and I put it up on Instagram. I'm like, the reach of this book, you know, because of people's determination, you know, and it's not so much about me, but it's about the stories that are in there. Seeing yourself represented in humbles me that so many people on the African continent want to see this work in their markets and... I will get it to them. Absolutely. But I am grateful right now that they are asking friends and family and whoever it is to get them the paper versions. I've even had people say to me, I've read it on Kindle. It's lovely. I want paper. <laughs> wow. That's and, really And good. that makes me happy because I'm an old school person who deals in words. So I'm a newspaper person. So I like the print product. So even people who have read the ebook Kindle version are still telling me we're waiting for prints to come because we want to see it proudly in our library. So I'm very, very humbled and very, very grateful by the response so far. But then again, as I did mention to you, it is still a new book. Yes. So we'll see. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, is you know, out of the some of the stories that you have told within the book, is there any particular story that you found to be more compelling and really really touching? that you really believe that the audience can really walk away with something from it? I mean, there were several. And then, there were, you know, what, what, what I tried to do was that, you know, even though I'm, I'm sort of like talking about all the, the quirks in our lives and all the difficulties and the, 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 uh, the um, I tried to give as well-rounded and as nuanced a, uh, a portrayal of me and all the people in my life as possible. But there were some things that are really, 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 um, that are really touching. And you know, I give you an example. So, one of the things that people have always tried to push when they try to denigrate people who don't have um, heteronormative um, sexual orientations is that it's not African. It's 
on Africa, this, uh, those of you who have crossed the pond and you've gone somewhere and you've brought this nonsense back and blah, 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 blah. And some of the people, you know, that I, I, I there's a particular couple that I met in rural Ghana where I work a lot. And one guy's a, a tailor and his partner works in a gold mine, but as a short order cook. Interesting. You know, okay. These, yeah, these are these are two middle aged, wonderful, wonderful men, very, very much in love with each other. Um, and if you sort of like in the same room with them, the energy is palpable. But of course, they're not. You know, they don't have the highest level of education. I don't think even. You know, one of them finished high school, and the other one just dropped out and became a tailor at a young age. Oh wow! You know, so they don't really. They don't have access to a lot of the internet. They don't have access to a lot of stuff. And they had to follow the customs and get married and have children. So they're both proud husbands and fathers. Really? But one of the things, yes. But one of the things that is what, that, that so touched me was that even with all of that, they understand that even with everything that they have heard and they've been told that this, this um, their most basic desire was to find love, a love that they could not explain. And they found it with each other, not with their wives, not with the many women they tried. I mean, you could technically say maybe they were bisexual, but when I talk to them, they're like, no, we're gay, but we have to be parents, we have to get married. I mean, this is just how it is, or we will get whatever. But they're so grateful to have found each other and to have found a community of other people that are like them. Yeah, wow, that's one such story. There's another story that, you know, really, really, till today it hurts me because this has been going on for 20 years. When I was a, a, an undergraduate at New York University, one of the great, great things that I did as an undergraduate was to do a study abroad program. And I went to Paris. At that time, when I was an undergrad, my university didn't have study abroad in the African continent. So I went to Paris and I studied the language, but one of the things that I immersed myself in was in the African community in Paris. And I made many, many friends, and one um, particular person that I fell in love with and we had a relationship was uh, a, a wonderful man from the Congo. Okay. And even at the time, you know, even after I graduated and I kept returning to Paris to see this man, there was this whole strange situation because you know, he was very upfront about wanting to have this relationship with me. And here I am, a Nigerian person who moved to New York and felt emancipated and didn't feel the need to be, quote unquote, in the closet. Yes. With all my superiority that comes with that, like I'm so much more evolved than you. You know, you live in Paris, but you're in the closet and you have a wife and you have a mistress and you have a boyfriend and you want to add me to the list. You know, so, so here's me. <laughs> yeah, here is me. It's like, you know, I've gone to NYU and I'm in New York and I've got a job and I'm so, you know, holier than thou. Yeah. This was when I was young and stupid and I didn't have the capacity <laughs> to actually understand people's situations. But right. so this particular person, and we're very close till this day, but he really, really had a very tough time in the Congo. Escaped to Europe and even in Europe, even in this in, in Paris, you know, you, I mean, as an immigrant, you don't just go and assimilate. You do what is familiar. So even in Paris, he was mixing with his fellow Congolese people, you know? And in that community, it was just absolutely impossible for him to be a boom gay. So he had to get married. And not only did he have to get married, he had to prove his virility by having all these mistresses. Oh, but wow. still, at the base, you know, even having the wife and the mistress and the kid, he still needed to find love. So wow. then he found uh, a boyfriend. And then here's me who comes along, who in his mind is sort of like the fantasy that he had wanted, an African gay person that he could be with. But it, just, it was just too complicated. Right. And so, you know, we didn't work out as a couple, but we have both grown in the years that have passed. And one of the things that has happened in the years that has passed is that he has, you know, since gotten divorced, since gotten rid of the mistress, since come out as gay and it's so wonderful because his son is now grown up and goes with him to um, gay pride parades. Wow. 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 Goes with him to gay pride parade. But one of the interesting things that we did, you know, was that once I invited him to come to New York City, 
and I took him to something called Soul Summit in Fort Greene. You may know about it. It's something that happens in the summer. It's a big party. And there he was in the middle of the dance and in the middle of all the Africanness, in the middle of all the blackness, looking back and saying to himself, 20 years of my life has passed by sort of in the closet and I couldn't be like these people. So it was a little bit tragic. So that's one other episode that touched me. And another episode that I deal with a lot in the book is the amount of people who have left the African continent. And we can look at Nigeria and Ghana and Uganda and South Africa who have left, who are very, very brilliant, high achieving people, strong businessmen, and they have left for one and one reason alone. These are not economic migrants. These are not people who can't have the best life they can, but these are people who choose not to conform to the bigotry and to now decide that they're going to get married and have children because they just don't want to do it. And so they leave these countries where they could be doing amazing things and they come here. I mean, if we look at New York City, they come here and they pretty much have to start all over again. And so there's a vast, vast, vast African gay asylum network in the Big Apple of people who are professional people, bankers and lawyers and doctors who just couldn't take it anymore. And they're here starting from scratch. They may be serving your dinner at a restaurant that you go to. They may be washing your car in the parking lot. But that's because they have had to leave and come here. So that's a, another problem that we, we sort of is under the radar, but then tackling in, in this in lives of great men as well. You know, it, it, it kind of tackles the the immigration policy also that <laughs> that our great president has now uh, begun to uh, tackle, uh, <laughs> to deal with. And so, well, first off, what are your thoughts on that, especially knowing that when it coming, coming from a lot of people who are of the LGBT community who really can't be themselves within their own country, they actually have to come to other places, such as America, which is considered at one point, considered to be the place where you can be who you are and you're more than happy. Yes. But now to see some of the things that are unraveling, how does that make you feel? I'm saddened, but, you know, one of the things that I, I deal with a lot in the book is, is hope. I believe that um, this country, with everything that it has been um, under the previous president, became a beacon of hope for others, especially people who were in the LGBTQIA um, family, in a way that the State Department had never been before. All of that is eroded under the first year of this president. However. I think that the American people have evolved, you know, that even when their government is pushing something, the American people will continue to be who they are at heart. It is a generous people who understand that their country has been built by others, and this place will be welcoming. It doesn't feel that way now, but, you know, perhaps I'm just an optimist at heart. But I believe that, um, I believe that the American people will not let other people down. I believe their government may, but I think the people themselves. And I can point to non-governmental um, people and entities who are doing stuff on my continent. When I think about what the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has done with polio and with malaria, that is something that is a gift of the American people. It may not be a gift of the American government, but there has been an engagement in contemporary times with the American people. And I think we will continue to see that. Now, not everything the American people have given to us in Africa in recent times has been great, you know, because we have had uh, an, an upsurge of um, violence against gay people brought about by American evangelists who lost the cultural wars in America and so have come to Africa to tell us that, uh, you know, our diversity we, the center of the world, we, where we have the cradle of humankind, we who have always understood that we're not all the same and that we have a, a great diversity. These evangelists have come to tell us that some of us are not equal. Wow. And some of us are terrible and some of us are going to eat each other's children up. So, you know, the American, you know, generosity has also come with this rapid, um, awful distortion in my mind. You know, there can yes. be a dispute about that, but in my mind, of Christianity. You know, if we look at the, the Kill the Gays bill in Uganda, 
to the same sex marriage act in Nigeria, to so many other things. These were as a direct result, or you could certainly draw a line between American pastors and American evangelism spreading anti gay sermons on the African continent. And many of those pastors, forgive me for saying this, in America are non entities because they've lost the wars here. They would say things that no one would pay any attention to. No one would give them the time of day in America, in Boston, in Houston, wherever they are. And people look at them here as fringe. But we're so welcoming on the African continent, and you come and we open our doors to you. And so I believe in the goodness of America. But like I said to a friend of mine, you know, the world is just like Queens. Sometimes you're really great, sometimes you're kind of messy. Right. <laughs> you know? And, you know, Americans do a lot of wonderful things on the continent in terms of, you know, malaria and healthcare and so many other things. But they've also given us, unfortunately, um, this quite awful anti gay um, thing through religion. Right. right. So, but I do believe in the generosity of the American people. And I know that even though the policy right now is so anti everything, the American people themselves will open up to people who are different because I see a new generation. I'm very, very fortunate that I actually teach. So, uh, you know, I see the difference in attitudes of young people who sit in my classrooms uh, at New York University, vastly different from people who are my age, vastly different from their parents. Of course, you'll still have people on the fringe end of either side, whether liberal or whether conservative. But the vast majority in the middle, they think differently. These are people who grew up with technology. They can easily find things out for themselves. Yes. So yes. They, they're, 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 their orientation towards their, their fellow people, they see their, 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 uh, the shared humanity quite easier than some of their parents. You know, I, sometimes I, I also you know, take a look at the numbers, too, especially for those who actually listen to the podcast. What I've noticed is that Ghana... Uh, in Africa, in particular, it it definitely, especially at certain points, it's a little surge in listeners, and it it does surprise me. <laughs> um, in, in particular, it was one particular surge when it came down to a uh, an author who was an LGBT author uh, when it came down to writing erotic literature. <laughs> so I, I found that very surprising. So it, it kind of speaks of the progress that you're beginning to see within Africa. So my question is, when it comes to that progress, what are you really seeing? Uh, within Africa that you are very happy that is really coming now to the forefront and giving a lot more attention and to battle the ideology that we currently see now? Well, one of the things that is interesting for me is the idea that 10, 15 years ago, certainly when I was younger, um, there was a sense of you know, this is there might be some gay people over there but you just kind of like ignore them. And with the rapid religiosity, what we saw was a lot of people taking the law into their own hands to attack people who were different, physically, with violence. And what has actually been sort of like a beacon of hope for me is straight people speaking out about it. People who have no real skin in the game saying, I don't think so, you know? I know what we believe and what we've heard, but I just I'm not down with that right you right. know and so that that is something that I had not seen before but in the last couple of years you have musicians who are very influential you have writers who are very influential you have people in the arts who are very influential and you just have ordinary people saying I don't think so gotcha I'm not into this caricature thing and and when you have um, allies who are willing to speak up publicly and say, no, thank you, I don't believe that. That is a good thing, because nobody fights their battles alone, you know? You can easily be dismissed if you're in the community that is oppressed, but when you have no stake in the game and you're a straight person and you're confident in your sexuality and you know that the diversity is your strength, then you can recognize that this is wrong and speak up about it. So for me, even though it is, um, um, not very much. The fact that people are speaking out who are not gay and saying no, thank you, is it's encouraging because it has to start from somewhere, and it has started. Wow, 
and honestly, I, I really uh, it's kind of funny because I do see a lot of people. Um, even when you go to Facebook, there are certain programs or little little mini bite sized information that always gives more of an insight in terms of the positivity, not just about LGBTQ within Africa, but just Africa in general. That was one particular guy that stood out to me where he put a video because he says he's going to Africa. He's never been before. So his parents say, oh my God, be careful. And so he pointed out all of the beautiful things that Africa has to bring and that a lot of people really aren't aware of. So for especially for us on the outside, we're kind of ignorant in our way, but definitely I'm beginning to see a lot more positivity in a lot of different directions with Africa. So one thing I wanted my listeners to know exactly, where can they buy the book that you have? So Lives of Great Men, um, I, I'm assuming most of your viewers, most of your listeners are in the United States. So for those in the United States, Lives of Great Men is available um, on Amazon, which is probably the easiest way. Yes. Um, you can have it shipped to you wherever you are. BarnesandNoble.com, you can do that. They will ship to you as well, wherever you are. It's also available, I believe, uh, Kmart Books has that. So uh, most people, you know, I think the default book buyers are usually Barnes and & Noble and Amazon. Awesome. And you can get the books there. If you are an ebook person, if you are a person who likes devices, it's also available on Kindle. Awesome, awesome. Now, of course, I like to follow people, so I'm sure to be following you after this. Thank you so much. Um, where can people follow you on social media? Um, well, I, I'm new to this thing called Instagram, but so far I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> And it's really sort of opened my eyes. So my Instagram handle is um, at Lives of Great Men. Lives of so, Great Men. That is a great man. Yeah. I also have a Twitter, which, you know, is just my name, at Frankie Adosio. Thank you so much for coming to the show. And on Facebook, actually, uh, Lives of Great Men has its own page. So one can find Lives oh. of Great Men book on Facebook. Okay. Okay. So for those who Facebook, you can find us there. Instagram, you can find us there. And on Twitter, you can find me at, at Frankie Adosian. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming to the show. I really, I really enjoyed this conversation. On top of that, it gives a little bit more people to understand what's going on outside of their borders. I really love that. Yeah, I mean, I really hope that people can um, sort of engage with your brothers and sisters who are, um, perhaps a little bit of a, a, a distance from you, but, you know, if you engage with us, you, you will realize that we have much more in common than the distance that perhaps separates us. And our experiences are slightly different, but there's a lot of similarities. And one of the reasons why I tell all these stories in Lives of Great Men is I want people to have a nuanced portrayal of us, you know. And that is simply that. It's like if you can have a accurate portrayal of who we are, you have no choice but to love us. Wow. I like that statement. Yeah, I like that statement. <laughs> Thank you again so much for coming to the show. Again, this is Thank you. Uh, Cheeky Frankie Endosian. And this is actually, again, Lives of Great Men. And I, for one, will definitely make sure I promote that book and help you out as much as I possibly can to let people know, hey, there's a lot of other things outside of our borders that we definitely need to bring more attention to and support. Thank you so much I for coming to it. the show. And again, this is Brother Speed Podcast signing off. You guys have a wonderful day.